and Director of Asian Studies. And uh, I want to welcome you all here to Georgetown this afternoon uh, for what will be a wonderful discussion, I believe, um, about climate change diplomacy. Um, we are especially thankful that Zairam Ramesh would uh, come down and join us here today, despite his very busy schedule. Um, this event is a SFS Asian Studies program event. Uh, but we'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, without whom uh, we would not have been able to uh, pull this off. Uh, and that includes our students in the Georgetown India Dialogue Student Group, uh, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, the SFS Global Human Development Program, the SFS Science, Technology, and International Affairs Program, as well as the Global Education and Leadership Foundation. Um, so basically, almost every program at Georgetown is here <laughs> to welcome you and sponsor you. So thank you so much for uh, coming today. Um, this afternoon's event will be moderated by um, Professor Irfan Norudin, um, who I will introduce in a moment. And then um, our guest speaker will offer some remarks and then take some questions. Um, <clears throat> Irfan Norudin is an associate professor in the Wall School of Foreign Service and is the newest member of our Asian Studies program. Uh, he specializes in the study of comparative economic development and policy making, democratization, and democratic institutions, as well as international institutions. He was a former uh, professor of political science at Ohio State University, as well as fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars. Um, he is a team member with the Lochniti Program on Comparative Democracy at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in New Delhi, and he is author of Coalition Politics and Economic Development, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. He has a PhD and MA in Political Science from the University of Michigan, and uh, it's been thanks to his efforts here in just the short time he's been here that we already have a lot more energy in our work on South Asia, and so we're very thankful to him for that. Our distinguished guest speaker this afternoon, this afternoon is Jairam Ramesh, who is a member of India's parliament and a senior political leader of the Indian National Congress Party. He was the chief negotiator for India at the 2009 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen. He has been a leading figure in international climate diplomacy for years and is currently a Fisher Family Fellow with the Future of Diplomacy Project at Harvard University. Uh, Mr. Ramesh was Union Cabinet Minister for Rural Development under Prime Minister Singh from 2011 to 2014. He held numerous high-level government posts from 2006 to 2014, including the Union Minister of State for Commerce and Power from 2008 to 2009. In the 1980s, he served as economic advisor to the finance minister he studied at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, Carnegie Mellon University, as well as the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, again, it's a real pleasure to have you with us. We hope this is um, not just, is the first of many times you'll come and visit us at Georgetown. Uh, and please, let's all give a, round, uh, a warm welcome to our guest speaker. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Well, I'm delighted to be here in what must be one of the most beautiful campuses in the US. I've lived in Washington earlier, but never had the privilege and pleasure of coming to campus here. And uh, I must say that at least campus-wise, Georgetown is vastly superior to Harvard. <laughs> uh, Irfan and my young friends here from India were very keen that I come and speak to you on climate change. And so what I propose to do is for the next 15 or 20 minutes, give you a broad overview of where we are on international climate change negotiations and open it up for more questions and answers because I'm sure many of you will have doubts, questions, suggestions, and comments on what I have said and what you have read on the area of climate change. 
Let me begin, of course, by saying that we take it that climate change is here. There are people still in the world who deny the science of climate change. But my talk is based on the assumption, backed by robust scientific evidence, that climate change is not a hoax. Uh, climate change is not an exaggeration. Global warming is a reality. The difference between this climate change and previous episodes of climate change in human history is simply this, that this episode of climate change is being caused by human intervention. Whereas in history, we have had periods of global cooling, global warming, but largely natural processes, cyclical processes. But what we are seeing in the last 100 years particularly, accentuated ever since the CO2 measurements started at Mauna Loa in Hawaii in 1957, is a buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide and increasingly hydrofluorocarbons, which act as a shield and lead as a greenhouse and act lead to global warming. And this buildup of greenhouse gas, as it's called, is not accidental, it's not cyclical, it's not a natural process, but is actually caused by human activity, by economic activity, agriculture, industry, electricity, transportation, buildings, and I will explain as I go along the contribution of each of these sectors. So I think there may well be some of you who would be skeptical about the scientific evidence on climate change. But I think over the last 25 years, accumulated evidence suggests that climate change is here. And the most visible manifestation of climate change is the frequency of extreme events has certainly increased. The frequency of extreme events like extremely wet days, extremely so snowy days, extremely dry days has certainly increased across the globe. Glaciers are under retreat. This again is incontrovertible. Mean sea levels have gone up. That again is scientifically incontrovertible. And therefore, without wishing to spend too much time on the science part of it, I do want to underscore the point that this is not some area in which we should have any doubt. Yes, there are uncertainties. Yes, there are probabilities. But to question the very foundation of the scientific work that has gone on over the last 25 to 30 years, which has established conclusively that human activity has caused a buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which has led to global warming, which has led to the phenomenon of climate change, I think defies the imagination. Now, in 1992, for the first time, the international community got together in Rio de Janeiro and signed on to what has now come to be called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, as it is called in bureaucratic, as it is called in bureaucratic language. This was then followed up in 1997 by the Kyoto Protocol, which divided the world into two broad categories, the industrialized countries and the industrializing countries. Again, in bureaucratic language, it was called Annex I countries and non-Annex I countries. Annex I had 38 countries, the industrialized countries, and the non-Annex I countries are the countries that were industrializing or have yet to industrialize. And ever since 1997, so for almost now for 18 years, the international community has been meeting in all the exotic places of the world, like Cancun. Uh, now they're going to be meeting near Machu Picchu. Uh, and they have tried to put their heads, heads together to come up with an international agreement that would limit the emissions of carbon dioxide, 
and that would limit the increase in temperature in the balance of the 21st century to two degrees Celsius over what prevailed in pre-industrial eras. So that's broadly the direction in which we are going. And as I said, this has been a gigantic collective effort under the framework of the UN, under the rubric of the UN, in which almost 193 countries have participated. Now, in Paris in 2015, it is widely expected that the international community would finally come up with an international agreement, with a global agreement, that would send a clear signal to the world that every country is going to take on some responsibility or the other to do its bit to control global warming. And there would also be a commitment on the part of the countries to provide assistance to different countries who will be adversely affected by the impacts of climate change. As we go to Paris, and that's what I want to focus on today, as we go to Paris, there are still, however, very many contentious issues that remain to be resolved that could well preclude an international agreement. But before I discuss what these issues are, I want you to understand that the foundation of the entire discourse on climate change diplomacy today is based on a world that prevailed in 1992. That is when the UN Framework Convention was signed. It was signed also by the United States. Senior Mr. Bush was the, was the president at that time. It was signed by all countries. And the Kyoto Protocol that was signed in 1997, as I mentioned. But the world that animates climate diplomacy is a world that existed in 1992. It's very important. In 1992, the United States accounted for 24% of world greenhouse gas emissions, by far the single biggest culprit. And developing countries, emerging economies, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, contributed far less quantities. China, for example, in 1992, contributed just about 11% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And India contributed just about 3%. And Brazil contributed about 1%. This was the world in 1992. The negotiators who negotiated that agreement in 1992 believed that this world would continue in the future. And therefore, the world was divided into two. The high emitters who would take on the responsibilities and the low emitters who did not take on symmetrical responsibilities. Now, guess what happened after 1992? After 1992, world economics got rewritten. And it got rewritten to the extent that in the year 2013, China accounts for 29% of world greenhouse gas emissions. The United States has fallen from 24% to 15%. Europe has fallen from 19% to 11%. And India has gone up from 3% to 6%. Brazil has gone up from 1% to 2%. Broadly, similar numbers for South Africa. So what has happened after 1992 is that you've had an explosion of economic growth in the emerging economies. And we have yet to discover an economic model that is decoupled from pollution. We have yet to discover an economic model that is decoupled from deforestation. And we have yet to discover an economic model that is decoupled from carbon emissions. But 
The paradox is the world has changed from 1992, but the negotiating framework remains ossified in a world of 1992. This is the fundamental paradox of climate change negotiations. The framework convention of the United Nations in 1992 was singularly bereft of any economic criteria. There is no mention of per capita income in that framework convention. There is no concept of graduation in that framework convention. That countries as they graduate and move along the economic ladder take on new responsibilities. That concept is also missing. The framework convention is a static convention, frozen in time, reflecting a world that has ceased to be relevant in reality in the year 2014. The key word used in the framework convention, which will come up over and over again in the discussions on climate diplomacy, CBDR, common but differentiated responsibilities, which means that we all have common, we are all in this together because climate is a global commons, so it's a common responsibility, but it's a differentiated responsibility. What that CBDR is, has been left delightfully vague to be interpreted by countries as they choose to see fit. And as I will explain to you, Brazil has interpreted this in one way, India has interpreted it a second way, and the United States certainly has interpreted it in a completely different way altogether. So common but differentiated responsibility remains the cornerstone of the Framework Convention. And what the Framework Convention did was to lead to this Kyoto Protocol, which was signed in Kyoto in 1997, when Mr. Al Gore represented the United States. It divided the world into the Annex I countries, which took on responsibilities for reducing their emissions, and the non-Annex I countries, which had China, India, Brazil, South Korea, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Indonesia, all the fast-growing economies were kept out, and the developed countries, the 38 industrialized countries, were given, in a top-down manner, numerical targets to reduce their emissions. And as you know, President George Bush Jr., when he became president, walked out of the Kyoto Protocol. America walked out of the Kyoto Protocol, did not, did not get ratified in the United States. And the grounds that President Bush gave was, how can the United States agree to any international agreement that did not impose any responsibility on the new emitters. Now, some of you are students of economics, I'm sure. And one of the first things you learn in economics is to differentiate between stock and flow. The United States has contributed to the stock of greenhouse gas emissions. China, India, Brazil, not so much Brazil, but certainly China and India and South Africa are contributing to the flow of greenhouse gas emissions. So one set of countries have contributed to the stock. A new set of countries are contributing to the flow. But the architecture imposes numerical targets only on the stock guys and lets the flow guys virtually free. So this has been, I'm simplifying a very complex negotiating arena uh, enormously so that I can put it in simple language so that all of you can understand. So this is the background to international climate change negotiations. And as we go into Paris, there are three speed breakers along the way to Paris. The road to Paris 
It's a very romantic road to Paris, no doubt. But there are three speed breakers. The first speed breaker lies in the architecture of the agreement. Should it be a top-down agreement like the Kyoto Protocol? Or should it be a bottom-up agreement? Should an agreement be based on numerical targets set by a group of countries and handed down to these countries? Or should the targets be set by the countries themselves? Which is a bottom-up approach. So the first speed breaker is the architecture speed breaker. Should it be a top-down agreement like the Kyoto Protocol or should it be a bottom-up agreement first? The second speed breaker is the differentiation speed breaker. How do you differentiate between countries? The climate change agreement differentiates, the Kyoto Protocol differentiates the countries as Annex 1 and non-Annex 1. Annex 1 has contributed to the stock, non-Annex 1 is contributing to the flow. And as I said, the responsibility is on the stock guys, but what about the flow guys? So how do you differentiate across countries? Because not all countries are at the same stage of economic development and emissions. So differentiation is the second speed breaker. And the third speed breaker on this road to Paris is the legal form of the agreement. What should be this agreement all about? Should it be legally binding? Should it be politically binding? A phrase that is used by the United States very frequently. The Europeans like the word legally binding. The Americans like the word politically binding. Or shouldn't it be binding at all? Which is what the Chinese and the Indians would love. So the nature of this agreement, the nature of the legally binding agreement, what should be legally bound? Whom are you legally binding to? What are the consequences of not meeting your commitments as part of this agreement? Those are the contentious issues. Architecture, differentiation, and legal form. These are the three speed breakers in this road to Paris. Now, why do these speed breakers arise? As students of, may, many of you would probably go into foreign service, although some of the people whom I met this afternoon were saying that they would like to go to investment banking, and I was just the hymn that uh, this is supposed to be a school of foreign service, and I find more guys going into investment banking, but I hope some of you will go into foreign service. Any international negotiations, particularly in the environmental field, you have to find a solution. You have to find an agreement which is politically feasible, which is economically desirable, and which is environmentally optimal. All three are important. You have to have an agreement that is politically saleable, that is politically feasible, you have to have an agreement that is economically desirable because you need economic growth to generate jobs. You can't do without economic growth. And you need an agreement that is also environmentally optimal. Now, many of us are faced with dilemmas in life. This is not a dilemma, this is a trilemma. You can't get all three at the same time. You can get two out of these three. You may get one out of these three, but what we have been searching for 30 years, for 20 years, is an agreement that meets all these three objectives. Politically feasible, economically desirable, and environmentally optimal. And if any of you have bright ideas on how we can meet all three objectives, you're all candidates for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and you have 15 months to come up with that solution. Now, economic growth is the main priority for most countries. Because without economic growth, you don't create jobs. But the economic growth that we have been 
used to for the last 100 years is a high carbon economic growth model. It's a carbon intensive model. There is no price for carbon. There's no international price for carbon. Well, there's no domestic price for carbon also in many countries. Or even when there is a price for carbon, that carbon, that price does not reflect the true value of the damage that is being caused. The price of petrol for And this political leadership will result in an agreement that would start the process of mitigating carbon emissions and adapting to the effects of climate change. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'd like to thank uh, Victor Cha and everyone in the Asian Studies Program for handling the logistics that made this afternoon possible uh, to the students in the Georgetown India Dialogue, without whom we wouldn't have even known that uh, Mr. Ramesh was available to come to Georgetown and to, who have put in a great amount of work advertising and, again, making this possible. Uh, immediately following our discussion, we will have a reception in the lobby uh, that is sponsored by the Global Education and Leadership Foundation, and I'd like to thank them for their generosity in supporting this as well. Uh, what I'd like to do over the next half an hour is facilitate a conversation. Uh, as you can undoubtedly tell, we have a very amazing individual over here uh, who could talk to us on any number of issues. And I imagine in the Q&A, uh, we'll broaden the conversation beyond uh, climate change. Except Indian politics. We'll, we'll keep. There was an election recently, by the way. <laughs> um, so we. I, what I'd like to do is start by asking a few questions over the next 10 or 15 minutes, and then open it up uh, to all of you who have been so patient in coming. Uh, when that time comes, I'll ask you to line up at the mics, and then we'll take questions. Okay? But if for the next 10 minutes, if you'll indulge me as I exercise the pr privilege of the moderator, I have a few questions for Mr. Ramesh. So let's start, in a sense, with that election. We won't talk too much about why it went the way it did, in fact, not at all even. Uh, but given that so much of what you did uh, over the last five years uh, came from the fact that you were at the table, one of the questions that must be asked if India is going to continue to play such a big role in climate change negotiations is whether at the elite level in the government you, you perceive a continued commitment to finding these solutions in the new administration, or maybe even more excitingly, but maybe less probably, whether there is a genuine voter pressure, whether citizens in India find, are beginning to recognize climate change as something important such that they will force any administration, whether of the right or the left or the center, to take this seriously, that this is not just an issue for rich countries, but that citizens recognize it and will force uh, Prime Minister Modi's administration to treat it with the same seriousness that you did when you were in office. Well, you know, um, it's a very, very interesting question. Like many things, India has taken a moral position on climate change. And that moral position is that we have every right to develop. You guys have polluted and built up the carbon dioxide levels. So you guys clean up, and then we will do our bit. This has been a broadly the moral position. I think it's been a wrong position, as far as I'm concerned. Because what this moral position ignores is the real effects of climate change in India. And my belief, and this is not just a belief, it's borne out by evidence, is that there is no country in the world that has the type of multiple vulnerabilities to climate change as India has. And let me give you just four of these vulnerabilities. First. India is crucially dependent on the monsoon. The rains that come in India between July and September, 70% of our rainfall, which drenches most of India, crucial for our agriculture, crucial for rural livelihoods, crucial for water supply. So the monsoon, what, what climate change will do to the monsoon is something that 
very, very key to our economic future. Second, we have 150 million people living along the hazardous areas of the coasts. We have a 7,000 kilometer long coastline. 150 million people living in the hazardous zone, vulnerable to a threat in increase in mean sea levels, flooding. Three, we have most of the Himalayan glaciers, 10,000 odd Himalayan glaciers, most of the glaciers are under retreat. Some glaciers are advancing, no doubt. Some glaciers are retreating at a reduced rate. But most of the 10,000 odd Himalayan glaciers that fall in the Indian geographical boundary are under retreat. And this has major implications for water flow. And fourth, and in my view, the most significant in my view, our natural resources, coal, iron ore, bauxite, are in our rich forest areas. So the more coal we use, the more coal we remove and extract for producing more power, the more iron ore we extract to produce more steel, the more areas we are going to deforest. And the more you deforest, the more you're going to add to the problem of global warming. Now, I can't see any country in the world which has these four vulnerabilities operating at the same time. Some countries like Maldives and Bangladesh are vulnerable to increase in mean sea levels. Some countries like Brazil and Indonesia are vulnerable to deforestation. But India is the one country, in my view, that has multiple vulnerabilities. So really, the debate should not be on what, what, why should India do? Why India must do something. Now, what India must do is something that you know, we can debate. But India must show the leadership. One of the advantages being a latecomer in the economic development game like India is, is that you don't have to repeat the mistakes of the other countries. The economic model followed by all countries is the grow now, pay later model. You grow for 25, 30 years, you have 7%, 8% rate of economic growth, and you pay the costs of that economic growth 30 years from now, right? That's broadly the model the United States and China and all these countries have followed. Now, India is embarking on that high growth path. We've had 10 years of high growth, and hopefully we'll have another 30 years of high growth. But rather than pay the costs of that high growth 40 years from now, we are in a position to make the investments to address those issues today. And we have to address those issues today. Why do we have to address those issues today? Very simple. Our population today is 1.25 billion. And we are going to add 400 million people in the next 35 years. We're going to add a population more than America. In the less, next 35 years, we'll have be 1.7 billion people. Not many countries in the world are going to add 400 million people in the next 35 years. So if you grow now, pay later, you are growing and somebody else is paying. There's no intergenerational equity here. If you grow now, pay later, the public health effects of what the environmental consequences are, are going to lead to morbidity patterns, which is going to stunt your economic growth. And it's already beginning. Delhi is already more polluted. It's probably the most polluted city in the world today, worse than Beijing. Whether it's water pollution, whether it's air pollution, whether it's chemical contamination, India is leading the world. So. You know, this moral position we must put aside for the time being. I know we are the spiritual leaders of the world and all that, you know, but we, this morality will not get, lead us so far. You have to really understand what the ground reality is. The ground reality is climate change is beginning to affect livelihoods of farmers, of women, of forest dwellers, of tribals. And for us to engage in international diplomacy on, morals, on moral, morality grounds, that you guys 
have dirtied it. You guys clean up. And we have a right to dirty, and we'll clean up later. It's not a, it's not, it's not a fair argument. So I have always held a view, and mercifully, my view is a minority view. It's not a majority view. That we, India, must show the political and intellectual leadership to the world on climate change. We are in a position to do it, and we must do it. Now, whether this new government will do it or not, I don't know. I hope that we do it. Because if we don't do it, then frankly, the international community is not going to be successful in arriving at any understanding. China has actually changed its position in the last five years. I want all of you to understand this. China and India had identical positions on all issues in Copenhagen. But today, the Chinese are far more pragmatic and nuanced than India. Simply because China is aware that it is the world's largest emitter at 29%. The gap between China and America has increased. And secondly, environmental issues have become the dominant issue within China. The Chinese Communist Party controls public discourse and public debate within the country. But one debate that they have not controlled in the media, in the social media, is the environmental debate. And if you follow Chinese politics, Chinese politics has two defining issues. One is corruption and the other one is environment. So the Chinese have shifted their position in the last five years. But unfortunately, India has not not yet read the writing on the wall. And hopefully, between now and Paris, some winds of pragmatism will begin to blow across our country as well. I'm going to pose you one more question. While Mr. Ramesh is uh, answering that question, if anyone would like to ask a question, if you could start lining up at the two mics, uh, that would be great. So you m said, and I think you'd find a little disagreement, that, of course, nuclear energy cannot be the full solution. And yet, nu nuclear energy potentially poses a solution to at least some of energy, the energy reliance of imports, uh, the reliance on carbon. Uh, in the summit that was just concluded between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi, the India's nuclear liability laws came under question. Uh, as a member of the Rajya Sabha, I mean, do you have any particular insight that you would like to share with us as to whether we're going to get that, whatever impediments exist to that relationship fixed, or is this something that you actually don't support? Well, in the post-Fukushima world, nuclear energy has come under very close scrutiny in every country. Germany has already announced that they are going to phase out nuclear power by the year 2020. The United States has not built a nuclear reactor since 1978. So nuclear power is a god that failed. Nuclear power was meant to deliver cheap electricity, but it has not delivered cheap electricity. But it is a clean source of power. It does not emit greenhouse gas emissions. But it takes a long time. It takes nine years to build a nuclear reactor, 10 years to build a nuclear reactor. And if Fukushima can happen, in a highly disciplined country like Japan, suppose Fukushima were to happen in any other country, you look at the consequences of that. So I'm afraid that nuclear power, you know, there are some myths that we have to learn to live, we live with, we don't dispel. I am not one of those who believe that we should abandon nuclear power. But frankly, one has to be realistic about nuclear Today, nuclear power accounts for only 3.5% of India's electricity supply. And by the year 2030, under the most optimistic of assumptions, this 3.5% will go to 4%. Under the most optimistic of assumptions. So I'm afraid nuclear power is one source of energy that we will continue to talk about we will continue to be mesmerized by, both for and against. But its actual contribution 
to greenhouse gas mitigation will be limited. And the bulk of the reductions must come from solar, wind, biomass, cleaner coal, hydel. You know, these are the sources of energy that will provide the energy mix for the future. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see so many questions. To get as many of them as we can in the time we have, keep your questions brief and to the point. And we'll take two at a time. Why don't so, we take, yeah, a lot yeah, of we'll questions. Yeah, we'll take yeah. some questions, then we'll let Mr. Ramesh. So how about we have the first two on each side ask your questions. Please be aware that this is being recorded. And so uh, it's for the record in the way that everything is in the internet age. Students, pay attention. Right? Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and if you could also introduce yourself and your affiliation, we'd appreciate that. Why don't we start here, and then we'll alternate sides. Mr. Ramesh, thank you for a great talk. Sarang Shidore, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, my question, I have two quick questions. One is uh, on HFCs. Uh, you picked that point up. The US and the EU would like India to be a part of an expanded Montreal Accord, which, uh, where India commits to HFC phase out in a very hard sense, in a hard target sense. What is your opinion on that? Should India join that uh, uh, Montreal Accord, including HFCs? And if so, what concessions should it uh, extract from? Okay from the US and the world community. And the second quick question is on Green Climate Fund. The commitments were $100 billion a year at Cancun. Only $1 billion has materialized. What are the leverages that India has in concert with other countries to make that happen? Thank you. OK. Ma'am. Need a Barbara Boxer stool. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Minister Ramesh. Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire. Nice to, you can't hear me. Can't hear you. Ha. Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire. Nice to see you outside of the madness of a UN conference. Um, this is going to be four questions because I'm going to sneak in too. Also, I, I'd love to first get your early thoughts on on the Modi administration and what you how you think that the, this administration is going to approach the climate talks. I think it's safe to say that the U.S. Um, you know, and, and other countries have not had the easiest time negotiating with India before and after the Ramesh administration. Um, I, secondly, I, I, I'm wondering if you can give your thoughts, you know, countries are supposed to come to the table next year with contributions, right, with what they're going to do to cut emissions after 2020. The Indian, the new Indian environment minister said recently, you know, what cuts? Um, other people have said, you know, look, nobody expects India to cut absolute emissions right now. Um, but what do you think is a reasonable contribution from, you know, a country that is both the fourth largest emitter and still dealing with vast issues of poverty, um, energy access? Is it a carbon okay. emissions target or something less? Okay. Uh, a very quick answer to both these questions. One, the Montreal Protocol deals with ozone depleting substances. The UNFCCC deals with greenhouse gas emissions. The hydrofluorocarbons are a green ga greenhouse gas. They're not ozone depleting. They are ozone augmenting. I mean, they stop the ozone depletion. So India and China took technically the correct view, technically, 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 the correct view that HFC phase down should be negotiated under the UNFCCC and not under the Montreal Protocol. I mean, this is a technical view. Yeah, it's a greenhouse gas. But you wouldn't have introduced the HFC had it not been for ozone depletion, right? So this, is, this has been the traditional position. Last year, China and the United States signed an agreement that they should negotiate the phase down of the Montreal, uh, uh, of HFC under the Montreal Protocol. And one of the paragraphs buried in the statement issued after President Obama and Mr. Narendra Modi's visit a couple of days ago was that India also uh, will follow the same approach. Right now, India is the only country in the world that is opposing the negotiations under the Montreal Protocol. But after the Modi-Obama agreement, I think uh, India will join the crowd. You know, So I have no doubt in my mind that that position is going to change. The Green Climate Fund, the less said about it, the better. You know, it's supposed to be $100 billion a year by the year 2020. The commitments are less than $10 billion, less than $10 billion. Various figures are floating around. Uh, and whether it is, how much of it should be public money, how much should it be private money, uh, 
whether it is new, whether it is additional. You know, there are lots of questions associated uh, with the fund, but I don't see a $100 billion uh, green climate fund becoming a reality in the immediate years ahead, particularly given the economic uh, conditions in the United States and Europe. Uh, uh, Lisa, your question on what can be a, a reasonable, please don't use the word contribution, you know. Yeah, I know, the language has moved from commitment to contribution. Let's go back to commitments, okay? We should go back, uh, you know, words have a meaning. Words are very important in, in diplomacy and in negotiations. And moment you say commitment means that you have a desire to actually do something. When you say contribution, it means, you know, let's see. If I can do it, I'll do it. If I don't do it, don't hold me, get, don't get me wrong. Uh, in Copenhagen and in Cancun, we talked of commitments. But the debate now has shifted from commitments to contributions. So I hope we go back from contributions to commitments, number one. Number two, in Paris, no country is going to make new commitments for 2020 over and above what was made in Copenhagen. I, I can't see President Obama improving on the 17% emission reduction, uh, emission cut by 2020, which he has already announced in Copenhagen. I can't see China making any improved commitment for 2020. I can't see India making any improvement commitment. But what? in Paris is possible, desirable, is that countries make some commitments for 2025 and 2030. That they must unveil in Paris some aspirational trajectory. The United States must unveil that. China must unveil that. India must unveil that. Germany has already unveiled it. In fact, the only country in the world which has taken this seriously is Germany. So if these three big countries unveil a trajectory for 2025 and 2030, I think Paris would be meaningful. But if they still talk the language of contributions, then I'm afraid you know we're going to meet in Paris and then decide to meet next year in Venice or some, some other place like that, you know? Uh, if questions, uh, again, brief, and then I'll encourage uh, Mr. Ramesh to keep his answers briefer as well. Please. Thank you, Mr. Ramesh. John Ryan from Georgetown and George Washington. You mentioned how we grow now and pay later, and that brings up the question of putting a price on carbon. And Europe has taken some missteps, and the United States has taken steps, and China is moving towards a national carbon market in 2016, and India has a, a dollar price on carbon. So what would be the role of carbon pricing either through taxes or markets going forward, especially with India? Thank you. Question on this side, sir? Yeah, Rob Wilson Black, uh, CEO of Sojourners, grateful for the T. Gelf co sponsorship. Wonderful talk. My question is about religion. You mentioned morality. We've reached that end. Let's time to show practical stuff. My question is about the, uh, the appeal to faith and faith. One finds that Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan is a problematic a call or an enlivening one. My old professor, Wendy Doniger, I think is, is, uh, is working in my head to ask is there not a way forward? Uh, to appeal to religious sentiment uh, for care for the earth in any kind of way. In the United States, we have blockage in that regard with people saying, uh, the world's going to end, it doesn't really matter, God's returning. But uh, we're very clear about, as, as Christians saying, God created the world perfect, human sin and complicity messed it up, and it can be redeemed. Is there any, any hope at all in that uh, uh, mode to, to appeal to religious and religious sentiment and the faith community uh, in, in India at this moment for, for progress? Ma'am, can you add your question to the mix, please? Uh, sorry. Um, my name's Adria Schwarber. I'm from the University of Maryland, getting my PhD in atmospheric and oceanic science. Um, my question was, in uh, the IPCC released their AR5 last year um, with their summary for policymakers. However, they kept out one of the charts that um, utilized the same groupings you were speaking about from the FCCC, um, but they removed it because it actually showed which countries were doing uh, the most greenhouse gas emissions. I was wondering, um, many people have criticized it as, in, instead of it being a summary for policymakers, as a summary by policymakers. And do you think that the removal of the chart was necessary for future dipl diplomatic actions like in Paris? 
the, the question. IPCC when they released their yeah, report, yeah, know, didn't yeah. have one of the charts, which was okay. the countries. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, so I didn't hear that? you properly. But I got it. Okay. Um, actually, let's take one last question okay. for this round. Okay. Uh, hello, Mr. Ramesh. My name is Annabelle. I'm a student in the School of Foreign Service. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. My um, interest got piqued when you talked about how we need a change in the way that our economic systems work instead of trying to make smaller adjustments in terms of what machines we use or things that will only modify on the, on the short term our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and being Indian, I'm sure you know about the Bhutanese initiative of gross national happiness. Um, but for those of you in the room who don't know, uh, Bhutan has initiated gross national happiness as its wealth indicator instead of um, GDP or GNP. And um, it's an indicator that's based on welfare of the population. Um, and that's been used by the UN in terms of uh, ecological sustainability. And I wanted to know what you thought about the prospects of this economic indicator in terms of finding a different model. Thank you. What was the IPCC question? Well, uh, the pricing of carbon issue, the first question that was raised, um, you know, this has been a debate that has taken place, that has taken place in every country. Uh, and in the United States, for example, there's been a huge debate over the last few years whether you should have a price for carbon, which is really a tax, or whether you should have a cap-and-trade system. The U.S. went for a cap-and-trade system, the waxman markey bill, that fell because of domestic politics. Uh, and now the US has neither a price for carbon nor a cap and trade system. There are some economists, most notably William Nordhaus, the most preeminent environmental economist today, who teaches at Yale, uh, who incidentally, those of you who are interested in climate should read his new book called Climate Casino. Very, very well written book where he recommends uh, his approach is to set an international price for carbon. That you negotiate an international price for carbon, uh, and that international price for carbon is set at between $20 a ton uh, and $40 a ton to be negotiated. Uh, and that price will really reflect the cost of putting carbon into the atmosphere. But I'm afraid uh, the prospects for pricing of carbon internationally uh, is very, very remote when countries are not able to summon the political courage uh, to price carbon appropriately domestically. So that's, I think, the dilemma we face. I personally, I think from a logistics point of view, from an administrative point of view, a carbon price or a tax on carbon makes eminent sense. But you know, in country after country, uh, the word tax is a four-letter word. You know, you don't want to, nobody wants to hear the word tax. Uh, and so, the prospects of of an international price of carbon, however desirable from economic terms, is not feasible in political terms. So maybe we will go for cap and trade. California is already talking of cap and trade. In the United States, you have a regional cap and trade, and perhaps in the years to come. Uh, the United States will have a cap-and-trade. Europe already has a cap-and-trade system. China has just announced that by the beginning of 2016, China will also have a cap-and-trade system. So maybe, maybe, instead of a price for carbon, the cap-and-trade may be the route that most countries will adopt. Uh, you know, I know I'm conscious and I'm speaking in Georgetown University. This is the bastion of faith and and religion, right? So I should be very careful of what I say on faith and religion. Uh, will, does it have a role to play uh, in shaping the climate discourse? Well, you know, I come from a country where the, far, the further we can keep faith and religion away from the public discourse, the better off we are, you know? Uh, of any type, of any type, you know? So now to bring them in into the environmental discourse, uh, you know, they will then begin to uh, sing. But I know the view that you have expressed has been expressed before. There has been an effort uh, to bring influential uh, 
voices from the faith and religion community across the spectrum to speak up on behalf of uh, climate change. I think I read a statement from the Vatican uh, many months ago who had assembled a group of top scientists. Uh, to, uh, they gave a statement on black carbon. So it's possible that uh, these voices will play a role. But you know, I come from the world of politics. Uh, and I have yet to meet a politician who will listen to the voice of faith and religion uh, if it means losing votes. Uh, and fact of the matter is today, uh, in countries like the US, particularly, uh, climate change is seen to be a vote-losing proposition, not a vote-gaining proposition. So maybe more voices should be heard. Maybe more people should participate in the global discourse. Uh, but I doubt very much as to what that impact is going to be, really. I'm not very sure. Uh, the, um, the last question was on... Uh, Different mm -hmm. indicators of global Yeah, the global last national. question was an interesting question. I'll come to the third question. The Bhutan question. Right. Yeah, the Bhutan question. Yeah, you know, this Bhutan question is a very interesting question because Bhutan is now not talking of GDP or GNP, but it's talking of gross national happiness. Uh, and, you know, that's a very amorphous phrase. Uh, uh, what is gross national happiness? And how do you measure gross national happiness? Um, GDP has been attacked for many, many years as being an incomplete measure of economic growth. That it does not take into account the environmental costs of economic growth. And many economists have tried their hand at redoing the GDP concept in order to accommodate the replacement of natural capital. But there is no unanimity on this. Some countries report GDP, and they also report adjusted GDP. Norway is an example of a country that reports both the GDP as well as an adjusted GDP. But you know, Norway is a country where GDP is growing at 2%. And when you adjust, have an adjusted GDP, probably two will come down to one. So it's not no dramatic change. But just look at a country like India, whose GDP is growing at 8%. And if you start calculating adjusted GDP, that comes to 3%. Which prime minister will want to report? What do you think the prime minister or the finance minister would do under such circumstances? Report the 8% figure or the 3% figure? Report the 8% figure. So economists and the economic community generally, the world of finance ministers and the world of economic advisors, has been generally reluctant to move to an adjusted GDP because that would depress the GDP figures enormously in countries like China and, and India. Uh, there are efforts across the world to have more realistic measures. We ourselves in India started an initiative that by 2015, we should report both the conventional GDP number as well as a GDP number that takes into account the environmental costs and sometimes the environmental benefits as well. Uh, so that was announced some years ago. I don't know whether we will still continue to stick to that deadline, but it's not easy. First of all, let me tell you, the economics profession is divided on how to do this. Meanwhile, Bhutan has come up with this gross national happiness. Uh, and uh, I suppose if you're between China and India, you're very happy, you know, <laughs> because you can keep both at bay. <laughs> but uh, to have a gross national happiness metric uh, is, uh, defies understanding. Uh, how are you actually going to measure it, report it, monitor it year after year? I think philosophically it's great, but operationally it has its limitations. No, are you going to explain to me what this IPCC question so is? So if I understand I the question. In, I didn't understand the if question. If I understand the question right, when the IPCC re released its report, the questioner suggests that there was a table in which the countries that were polluting the most identified had been excluded. And the question was whether or not this was, in fact, rather than being recommendations for policymakers, had actually been co-opted by the policymakers themselves. Was such that the that question? Credibly. 
such that the credibility of the report might be suspect. Now, which IPCC report are you referring the AR5? to? AR5. AR5. Well, you know, the latest one? I mean, the, the new one? Well, you know, um, the IPCC reports is a peer review report. Uh, IPCC reports have drawn a lot of praise. They've drawn a lot of criticism in the past. Uh, but by and large, I think they have been fair reports. I think there has been no, barring one or two odd instances here and there, by and large, over the past decade and a half or two decades, the IPCC reports have been sober in nature. And I don't think the assumption that you are making is that the AR5 report somehow uh, has been orchestrated or doctored, am I right? Uh, to reflect a different set of conclusions. If that is your question, then I would say that I find that hard to believe. Is that the question? In effect, but let's come back to the Let me talk to you later, yeah, yes. let me talk to you later. Uh, we have got very limited time, so I'm gonna ask you for essentially a rapid fire round of questions. Right, and then Mr. Ramesh can pick and choose which of those he chooses to answer. Also rapid fire answers. Rapid fire answers as well. <laughs> and uh, remember that we'll have a reception at which I'm sure you can uh, try and get more answers to more questions. So, sir, we'll start here. I'm Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute in the US. And uh, I'm interested in what India is doing for energy efficiency in buildings and whether or not you're moved forward with direct current microgrids as opposed to Energy alternating currents. And, and I presume you're going to use microgrids as opposed to the traditional grid we have here. And, and finally, are you really ramping up the production of solar panels in India? Thanks. OK. Hi. Uh, Rohan from the Sierra Club. Um, the question is, President Obama recently announced uh, a clean power plant that put limits on coal power coal-fired power plants, do you think, you mentioned coal in your talk, do you think India needs to put similar regulations on coal to control air pollution so we don't end up with the China air quality situation? Thank you. Speak up a little. Yeah, could you speak into the mic? Yeah. Sebastian with the School of Foreign Service. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk about deforestation recently and halting deforestation. There's a 2030 target. The oceans taken together are a bigger carbon sink than all of the rainforests, but there's little policy on them, even though arguably there's an environmental crisis going on in the oceans. So what prospects do you see for international negotiations on regulating the oceans or addressing the crisis uh, in the near or far future? Hi, uh, I'm Chandar Prabhas Sharma. Uh, I'm a computer engineer. I'm pursuing master's in public policy at Georgetown. So uh, you mentioned bilateral, the importance of bilateral agreements. And if we take some cues from the impasse, current impasse and WTO negotiations that are happening right now, there are opinions that uh, multilateral agreements might be more difficult compared to bilateral uh, negotiations because countries might find common geopolitical and economic situations that they can agree upon. So do you, can you, uh, talk more, uh, explain to us if what your opinion is on the scope and relevance of bilateral agreements in environment. Thanks. Let's just take all the questions. Hi. Um. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Christina James. I'm a graduate student in the uh, School of Foreign Service. My question um, goes back to your statement about um, the Himalayan glaciers um, in, that are sort of in retreat and what the uh, sort of um, climate diplomacy implications are for relations with Pakistan and um, other neighbors of India. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Um, yeah, I'm Trixia Piado, a um, freshman in the SFS. Um, I have a very simple question about implementation. So these climate negotiations are made by the governments, but since much of the industry are private, how do the governments ensure the private industry follow these climate agreements? And if there's a way that these industries are monitored, is there a way to prevent briberies to falsify reports, especially since I'm sure in the industry industrializing countries, corruptions are just way too rampant. Thank you. Here, Tom Brown, the Segal Foundation. We do rural development in uh, India. 
um, water levels are rising at sea and they're rapidly declining in under the ground. Agriculture consumes 80% of water. Uh, could you imagine uh, farmers in India switching to micro or other water saving irrigation in order to preserve the groundwater so that women will have to walk less far and find healthier water to carry home? Thank you. Last question, sir. Uh, my name is Abu Saleh Sharif uh, from U.S. India Policy Institute. I remember, uh, with due respect, sir, you were minister for both environment and agriculture. So I'd like to know, uh, this is a dialogue on engaging India. So can you give the perspective, the relationship between environment and agriculture in India, given the future food needs? Uh, I remember you tried to relocate uh, lions from Gir Forest to another forest in Madhya Pradesh as environmental minister. Um, so the, the reason why I'm giving this reference is how strong are our implementative uh, uh, procedures in India uh, to implement and um, uh, especially the industry response? Uh, how strong is that? Uh, I mean, is it feasible to uh, uh, fix targets which are feasible in India? Um, uh, I would particularly like to know what kind of pressures did you face as environmental minister from industry? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you think you can answer all of that in about 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't you pick one or two of those to answer and then maybe... Okay, I'll, I'll pick up some of the interesting ones. and we can, Some yeah. of the questions which I don't answer, maybe we can pick it up bilaterally. The deforestation question I want to pick up because it's very Im important. Uh, you know, forests are a carbon sink. Uh, and we did an estimate some years ago that uh, India, uh, the Indian forests, roughly 70 million hectares of forest, uh, size of Texas, it absorbs something like 8% of India's annual greenhouse gas emissions. It's not small, it's very big. Uh, India is a net reforester, unlike Brazil or Indonesia, which have been net deforesters, India is a reforester. We are adding to the green cover. But the quality of our green cover is very poor. So we have to improve the quality of green cover. And in my view, in my view, a relatively easy way of absorbing carbon dioxide emissions is actually expanding the area under green cover. So reforestation is very, very crucial. Stopping the rate of deforestation in Brazil and in Indonesia and increasing the rate of afforestation in places like India and China, very important. And one of the building blocks of the international agreement in Paris is an agreement on forestry, you know, to reduce emissions through reduced deforestation. And I hope that we would be able to arrive at this agreement. The oceans uh, have traditionally not received as much attention uh, as they should. There's a blue carbon. This is called blue carbon. There's black carbon. Uh, this is blue carbon because a lot of the carbon dioxide is being actually absorbed by the oceans and there is a great fear that the oceans will become more acidic in nature as a result. Uh, so therefore, uh, how, we, how we deal with the oceans, marine biodiversity, these are big issues that so far uh, have not received, the forests have received a lot of attention, but oceans certainly haven't. And I would, tend, I would agree with you that in the next couple of years, blue carbon, the issue of oceans, and the role that they play in the carbon cycle is, is, is crucial. I want to address this problem of, on coal. Well, that's a very important issue. It's important in the US. It's important for China. It's important for India. It's important for Poland. It's important for many countries. Coal is the most important energy resource for many of these countries. 65% of electricity in India comes from coal. So we, people will say, have been talking about clean coal. Now, clean coal is an oxymoron. You know, it's, you cannot have clean coal. Uh, it has to be cleaner coal. But clean coal is a contradiction in terms. But in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, I do not see the prospects of uh, the United States or China or India reducing their dependence on coal. Maybe over a long period of time, 20, 25 years, uh, this dependence will come down. But uh, I think in the immediate horizon, uh, 
this dependence on coal will continue. But I do want to mention Germany in this context. Anybody of you from Germany here? No. Ah, there you are. Well, you know, Germany is a remarkable country. It has no business being a world leader in solar energy. But today is the world leader in solar energy. For six months, you don't see the sun in Germany. Uh, for the next six months, you see it, see it intermittently. Uh, but today, the Germans, today as we speak, 30% of electricity in Germany comes from solar and wind. And that power is being exported even to France, where 75% of the electricity comes from nuclear power. The question that you raised. So Germany is one country. Now, there are smaller countries, Finland, Norway, Sweden, but these are small countries. Germany, 80 million people. Industrialized country, the world's leading industrialized country. If Germany has made this energy transition away from a dependence on fossil fuels, I think other countries can. So the United States, China, and India must have a lot to learn from Germany and how the Germans are able to accomplish this. I must tell you a very interesting story. I went to Germany three weeks ago. And I met a German friend of mine who is half Indian, half German. Just relocated to Germany. He came to meet me, received me. And I said, we were just talking. And I said, uh, how much do you pay for electricity in Germany? What's your electricity bill, Arnie? So he said, you know, uh, Mr. Ramesh, I don't pay anything for electricity. So he said, wow, you've transplanted your Indian behavior to Germany. How did you manage that? <laughs> so he said, no, I'm an energy producer. I'm no longer an energy consumer. He's generating power through solar and wind, selling that power to the grid and getting a guaranteed income for a 20 year period. And you'll be surprised to know that in a population of 80 million, 6 million Germans today are generating power. They're, Germany is soon going to be a country of energy producers. It's already become 8% of German population generating power and the grid, the utility has to buy that power by law. So it is possible, the person who asked me the question on coal, it is possible to move away from fossil fuels, but it requires the type of political vision and political determination that the Germans have demonstrated, which sadly has been missing in the United States or China or India or many of these other fossil fuel economies like South Africa. Brazil is in a unique category of its own because 80% of the electricity in Brazil comes from hydropower. So the Brazil is not in this category. It's the big fossil fuel economies that, have, that face this challenge. Last question on multilateral versus bilateral. Uh, yes, all that we have talked about is a multilateral agreement. But you know, climate is a global good. Uh, if two countries have an agreement, let's say China and America have an agreement, it's a bilateral agreement on controlling carbon emissions, then all factories from America and China will go and locate in a country that is not party to the agreement. This in economics is called a free rider problem. So problem in a bilateral agreement is a free rider problem. You need a multilateral agreement so that all countries are really part of it. Some countries will take on more responsibilities. Some countries will take on less responsibilities. But you see, there is no such thing as carbon dioxide made in USA or carbon dioxide made in China. CO2 goes into the atmosphere, spreads, and stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So that's why you need a collective agreement because everybody is putting this... CO2 into the atmosphere. That's why you need a multilateral agreement, not only a bilateral agreement. You can have a set of bilateral agreements, but those bilateral or plurilateral agreements must be part of a larger multilateral agreement. Is that all? Time for? Um, unfortunately. Yeah. I should say uh, one correction before I may. Uh, Georgetown might be a Catholic institution, but as a Jesuit institution, asking questions that make trouble is part of the mission. So, <laughs> so never be afraid of offending. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I should also say that even though this is your first visit, there is a connection. Um, you know, long, not so long ago, because Mr. Ramesh is a young man still. 
right? Uh, he was an RA to uh, Professor Charles Weiss when, at the World Bank. And of course, as you know, Professor Weiss has just retired after 17 years of beginning and leading the program on science, technology, and international affairs, a really unique initiative here at Georgetown. And from where solutions to the kinds of problems that Mr. Ramesh was talking about will hopefully come from you students. So thank you, uh, Professor Weiss, for all the work you've done. Thank you, Mr. Ramesh, for what was a truly stimulating talk. Uh, join us for a reception and ask more questions. Thank you. Very good, Thank you, sir. <laughs>